My last lecture on Plato's Republic will not be about Plato at all. It will be instead a tribute to Plato, because what I plan to do in this lecture is discuss his influence on the subsequent history of Western political philosophy. The 20th century philosopher Alfred North Whitehead once said, "The safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition." Is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato, very famous idea that the rest of the history of philosophy is no more than footnotes to Plato. On the one hand, this is so obviously preposterous that it's easy to dismiss, for it suggests that all the the remaining philosophers in the history of the West. Added nothing new, made no real progress. They simply were tinkering with something Plato had already thought about, and I certainly don't think that's the case. I think many philosophers have said many new and interesting things after Plato. But there is a sense in which Whitehead, I believe, is correct. The sense that I was trying to emphasize in the previous lecture. Plato didn't give us all the answers, but he may have asked all the questions. He got a whole process of thought into motion. This process subsequently became the history of philosophy. Again, I don't want to get too carried away with my enthusiasm for Plato. Perhaps that's what happened to Whitehead, but I am nonetheless very confident that there is a, a, a chunk of truth. In Whitehead's characterization, and that's what I'd like to illustrate to you in this lecture. I'm going to discuss a very small sample of political philosophers and try to show you how they were responding to questions that Plato asked. It's not going to be necessary for me to prove to you that in each and every case. These philosophers were actually even reading Plato, not to say actually responding directly and literally to him. I don't have to prove that. What I am going to try to show you is that they are participating in a conversation whose origin is the Republic. Let's start with Aristotle. He was Plato's student. He came down from Macedonia in the north, and he studied in Plato's academy from 367 to 347. He began when he was 17 years old, and he left when he was 37 at the death of Plato. Clearly, Plato was the monumental influence on Aristotle. But like every good student, Aristotle not only absorbed. The lessons of his teacher, he also criticized. Let's consider a book he wrote titled *The Politics*, a book which became hugely influential, especially in the Middle Ages when Aristotle was a dominant force in European civilization. The curriculum of the of the first European universities, which arose in the Middle Ages, were in fact. Established by Aristotle. In Book Two of the Politics, he explicitly criticizes the Republic. Let's just look at a couple of points he makes. He says that, for example, Socrates's just city is too unified. You recall that a major objective of the legislation and the regulation that Socrates proposes. Is to foster unity among the cities. He used a phrase such as the community of pains and pleasures. If another citizen feels a pain, I should feel a pain. That's how close the link should be between citizens. You recall the noble lie. The noble lie tells us that all citizens have the same parent. The parent is the city. We should all therefore be patriots. Literally. Meaning, treating the city as our parent, we should all act as if we were siblings, brothers and sisters. We have the same parent. 
This, of course, is a major emphasis in the Republic, and it's exactly what Aristotle criticizes. He says a city can't be like a family. That, that's in essence what Socrates proposes with the noble lie, is that the city become one big family. Aristotle is a very patient and methodical observer of reality, and he notices that cities are really quite different from families. There can be intimacy and solidarity in the family. It may, however, be a big mistake to attempt to generate such intimacy and proximity in the city. Another way to put this point, by being a bit more specific, is to remind ourselves of the abolition of private property that is focused in the Republic on the guardians. They don't have private homes, they don't have any private property, nor do they even have a private family. The city is their family. Aristotle argues in Book Two of the Politics that this is a very counterproductive measure. He makes an argument which will sound very familiar today. He says, look, People really only care about property when it belongs to them. If I own my own house, I'll take care of it. If I don't own it, then I might not take care of it. A very familiar debate that we have had in American politics for many, many years. Every time that government takes over a certain function in the lives of citizens, some people react by saying, no, government shouldn't do this because if government intrudes, then citizens become apathetic. They don't, they're not nearly as productive. They're not as energized. What really gets people active and productive is owning their own property. This is a debate. We're having it now. Aristotle had it with Plato in his criticism of the Republic. For me, this is a perfect example of what it means to say that the history of political philosophy is like a footnote to the Republic. Plato didn't answer the question definitively. No one reads the Republic and says, aha, I have the answer to every political question, but a question is set into motion. Aristotle continues the conversation. Another point Aristotle makes, very much a follow-up to the Republic. Aristotle warns us, don't be too idealistic when you approach politics. Politics belongs to the real world, and if you are obsessed with your philosophical, theoretical ideal, you might end up in big trouble. So what Aristotle does is spend a lot of time, this largely takes place in books three, four, and five of his politics, articulating what is the best possible city. Aristotle is a man of the real world. Plato, at least in Aristotle's eyes, is too much of an idealist. And what Aristotle proposes is a blend of democracy and oligarchy. This is his recipe for what would be the best possible city. Very familiar ideas. Democracy and oligarchy, Plato didn't quite invent them, but he certainly was the first to explicate them so carefully in the Republic. Aristotle has real appreciation for democracy, but he's worried about the possibility of mob rule, he doesn't think there should be too much direct democracy. The people, the majority, the demos are very good at making certain kinds of decisions, but not all decisions. So we need a little bit of oligarchy, rule by the few, the oligoi, to balance out the democracy. If that sounds familiar, it should. It resembles some of the ideas held by the founding fathers, who, in the creation of our own American system, built into it non-democratic features, precisely to counterbalance 
the democratic features of the political regime. Again, these are ideas that have been in play now for centuries, Aristotle versus Plato echoing all the way until our own time. Let me jump ahead by centuries and talk about the great political philosopher Niccolo Machiavelli. He lived 1469 to 1527, and here, of course, I'm using dates from the Common Era. He wrote a very famous book titled The Prince, a book that has been tremendously influential. Like Aristotle, Machiavelli was a realist. He was a realist with a vengeance. Machiavelli believed that nothing could be worse than idealism, especially in politics. And here's, I think, what he has in mind. Let's imagine a prince, and Machiavelli is writing at a time in Italy which actually resembles the ancient Greeks whom we've discussed, it was a time not of Italy as a country. It was a time of small city-states like Venice, Machiavelli's own city was Florence, Pisa. Each city was run by a prince. Machiavelli's book, The Prince, is addressed to a would-be ruler of a city-state. And once again, his main point, which sounds very surprising perhaps, is don't be too idealistic, don't be too moral. One of the things a ruler has to learn, according to Machiavelli, is how to be cruel, how even to be evil. Sounds horrifying. His point is that a ruler who is so obsessed with being good and being moral will be very rigid and will not be able to anticipate all the contingencies and problems and realities of real-life politics. Machiavelli is said to have invented realpolitik, politics which takes its bearings not from some theoretical structure like Plato's Republic, but from the real world of blood and battles, political infighting, self-interest. He was the expert at that. Let me tell you one of the questions that Machiavelli asks and then proposes an answer to, which I think is very revealing of his attitude towards politics in general. He asked the question, should a ruler be loved or feared? Well, best of all would be both. But what if you couldn't have both? What's the best way to rule? By love? or by fear. Machiavelli argues by fear. And here's why. Love is dependent on someone else. I may try to get you to love me, a ruler may try to get his subjects to love him, but people are very fickle, and I might fail. Whether I'm loved or not is up to you. And that's a bad situation, says Machiavelli, for a prince to be in. Fear, however, is up to me. If I inflict severe bodily harm on some of the citizens and make it very clear that I'm willing to do so again, I think I can get my people to be afraid of me. That's the effective tool of rule. Another way to put this point, and Machiavelli is famous for this position, is that the end justifies the means. The end of the prince, the goal of the prince's work, is to achieve political power, political stability, and whatever it takes to achieve this, whatever means are necessary to achieve this, are acceptable to Machiavelli. The end justifies the mean. This reminds me of Thrasymachus in Book One of the Republic. Indeed, it sounds like precisely his praise of injustice. Did Machiavelli read Book One of the Republic? I honestly don't know. 
but I am certain that he is continuing this conversation that Plato began when he had this character, Thrasymachus, raise the possibility that a life of injustice is superior, more powerful, mightier, freer than a life of justice. I turn next to Thomas Hobbes, who lived 1588 to 1679 and was the author of the book Leviathan. Hobbes is usually counted as the founder of English moral and political philosophy. He was very much under the influence of the physicist Galileo. He was the first philosopher in modern times who tried to combine the mathematical physics of Galileo with political philosophy. He was a materialist. A materialist is someone who believes that reality itself is constituted by nothing except matter, or to be slightly more precise, nothing except atoms and the void through which the atoms move. Saying that suggests immediately, of course, that he was an anti-Platonist, Plato believes that the forms are real, the idea of the good is real, and neither the forms nor the idea of the good are material. Once again, we have a basic disagreement. Hobbes knew very well that he was criticizing ancient philosophers. He devotes a whole chapter, chapter 46 of his book, The Leviathan, to a critique of ancient philosophy, specifically on this issue of immaterial substance, something real that's not material. Hobbes was also a, what's known as a social contract theorist. A social contract theorist is someone who believes that human beings originally, in what came to be known as the state of nature, were not political. And according to Hobbes, in the state of nature, before there was government, state, politics, in the state of nature, human beings were completely free. This sounds very good, except for the fact that in the state of nature, because we were so free, one of the things we did in the state of nature was go after other people's property. The state of nature, in fact, as Hobbes describes it, was a war of all against all. Everybody is competing against everybody else, trying to outdo everybody else. There is no government. There are no inhibitions. There are no constraints on human acquisitiveness or human freedom. The life in the state of nature, according to Hobbes, in a famous phrase, is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Therefore, what people did, and this, of course, is a theoretical principle, it's not a historical fact, what people did was engage in a social contract. They made a kind of deal. They created a government, and the government would restrict their freedom. And this is a loss. The gain, and a contract implies loss and gain, the gain was security. In the state of nature, I always had to be afraid of you because there was nothing to stop you from punching me in the nose and taking my property. One can't do that when there is a government. The government puts a clamp on our behaviors and doesn't allow us to do everything we want to do. Again, loss and gain. It's rational, in short, for human beings to give up some of their freedoms in exchange for security. I hope that sounds a bit familiar. It should remind you of what Glaucon says at the beginning of Book Two of the Republic, because there he suggests that justice is not good for itself. You recall, perhaps, that Glaucon identifies three different kinds of good things. Some good things are good for themselves, some good things are not good for themselves, but bring good consequences. An example would be a very bad tasting medicine that has a good effect. 
some good things are good for themselves and for their consequences. And there Glaucon says, most people believe that justice is number two. It's not good in itself. It's only good for its consequences. That's a version of the social contract theory. Not only Hobbes, but John Locke, Rousseau, John Rawls. These are famous names in the history of social contract theory. They could all be construed without too much exaggeration as footnotes to book two of Plato's Republic. Let me mention next Immanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804. Kant was almost certainly the greatest single philosopher of the modern age. He was surely the greatest single moral philosopher in modernity. He wrote a book titled The Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, which is still taught today. It's taught in almost every introductory ethics course in almost every American university. Kant developed the concept of what he called the categorical imperative. Without going into any detail, what the categorical imperative is, is an absolute demand for moral action. A categorical imperative is categorical, meaning no ifs, ands, or buts. So the famous example that Kant gives of the categorical imperative is the prohibition against lying. One should not lie under any circumstances, even circumstances as dire as the one he imagines. Imagine there was a, a murderer on the loose, and he was chasing somebody. And this person came to your house and said, please, give me shelter. OK, you would say, you can hide it in my basement. A few minutes later, the murderer knocks on your door and says, is there somebody hiding in your basement? This will not sound too plausible, but Kant would say, you are not morally permitted to lie even in those circumstances. That, again, is what is meant by the categorical imperative. It's an absolute demand on moral action. I mentioned the example, of course, because it puts us into conversation with Socrates. For Socrates, lying goes to the heart of politics. There could be, Socrates suggests, no city that didn't lie. This is the famous noble lie. And Socrates tells other lies. Perhaps you recall that in the attempt to regulate sexual reproduction, he fabricates a lottery. He tells people it's a matter of chance, whereas in fact it's a matter of design. Kant was a great believer in human dignity and individual autonomy. Kant was an egalitarian. He believed that every human being simply by virtue of the fact that he or she was human, deserved respect, deserved to be treated with dignity. I would remind you in this context of Socrates' medical ethics. I made much of this precisely in order to suggest the kind of contrast with a philosopher like Kant. For Socrates, my example, perhaps you recall, was of a 90-year-old man in the hospital. For Socrates, all human beings are not created equal. All human beings do not deserve equal amount of respect. The 90-year-old in the hospital, perhaps, says Socrates, shouldn't even be given health care because it's a drain on resources, resources that could be rationally allocated somewhere else. For example, the treatment of a healthy person who suffers a broken arm or has a, a virus, that's a good use of medical resources because such a person gets back to work. The 90-year-old is never going back to work. To put it very cruelly, let's let that man die. I think that's the Socratic motto. Kant would absolutely disagree. Again, we have a conversation.
John Stuart Mill lived from 1806 to 1873, and he's often thought to be the greatest British philosopher of the 19th century. He wrote many books on many subjects. I'll mention only one, On Liberty. This is the crucial text for modern liberalism. Liberalism is a bit of a dangerous word because the way we use liberal in contemporary political discourse is not what someone like Mill has in mind. A liberal, in Mill's sense, is someone who identifies liberty as the fundamental principle of political and moral life. According to Mill, the only justification for restricting the liberty of anyone is to prevent that person from harming or restricting the liberty of someone else. Very familiar ideas to us. It goes without saying that these ideas are the antithesis of the Republic. The Republic is not a place which values liberty in this sense. To use another word, freedom, the Republic is not a place where freedom is a paramount concern. Let me put the point in the following way. According to Mill, if the law doesn't say you can't do it, then it's okay to do it. I can do anything I want as long as the law doesn't prohibit it. For Plato, it's quite different. I think the Platonic response would be, you can only do what the law tells you to do. A basic difference indeed. Mill would justify his liberalism by arguing that the liberation of individual talents leads to great progress, and the position could not be further from the one embraced by Socrates. Mill also, in another book titled Utilitarianism, also with Kant, although for different reasons, argues that lying is just fundamentally wrong. Mill argues not by means of a categorical imperative, but in terms of the consequences of lying. If I lie to you and you discover I've lied to you, our relationship will be plagued by distrust and insecurity. And that's a bad thing. And that's why, according to Mill, we shouldn't lie. So once again, even though he disagrees with Kant's reasoning, he joins Kant in criticizing Socrates' noble lie. Karl Marx lived from 1818 to 1883. He was the major source of inspiration for all forms of modern social radicalism, especially in the 20th century. I'll mention just a couple of points which make contact with Plato's Republic. Marx was famous for arguing on behalf of the abolition of private property. You recall, of course, that this is a feature of the life of the guardians. They have no private property. For much the same reason, Marx would deny private property in order to foster social solidarity, to foster communism. We live in common. A disagreement with Socrates would be that Marx also advocated the abolition of classes and class distinctions. By contrast, of course, Socrates is adamant about keeping the city stratified, gold, silver, and bronze. Again, and I'm certain Marx did read Plato, I'm not certain that he was explicitly commenting on the Republic when he wrote Capital, but he certainly knew Plato was in the background. He's in a dialogue with Plato. On the one hand, to go back to Whitehead's quote, it's absurd to label these great thinkers as mere footnotes to Plato. They do, however, all take up themes that Plato first explored. And this is, I hope, a fitting way for us to end this course. With disagreement, and with dialogue. We've just seen how this very small sampling 
of Western political philosophers disagrees, takes up issues against Plato's Republic. But in doing so, they bring it to life. And that has been my own objective in teaching this course, which I hope you've enjoyed.